and Dominica Yafrajak. Whether you eat out or in, I'm sure Jack will agree, the quality of the ingredients and the care and the skill with which it's prepared is key to successful and sustainable dining experience. Most people go to a restaurant or fast food vendor and order from a menu, but there's another way. In a unique combination of education and craft, a meal at the Salt Fire and Time is truly in a class by itself. This establishment is a community-supported kitchen. The next step beyond community-supported agriculture. So first the food is grown, and then it has to be prepared somewhere. So in our community spotlight this month, we step out for an up-close look at the growing popularity of CSK, community-supported kitchens. Have a nutritious, delicious, and cooperative dining experience. How about a little salt, fire, and time? Today we're here with Tressa Yellig, the owner of Salt, Fire, and Time. She's going to tell us what's going on in her kitchen. How are you? Hi, I'm really glad you guys could be here tonight. We're doing a great dinner series. I am so excited. I'm going to get my hands soaked in some food. I can't wait. Let's All get right. started. Sounds good. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. oh, they're over there. Okay. A community-supported kitchen is really just a loose guideline for creating a greater degree of transparency in the food economy. And whatever that local food economy is, it's going to change based on that community's needs. So what's, what's cool about it is that as community-supported businesses are growing, what they're asking is for consumers to participate in the life cycle of a business, which is really exciting and unique in that you don't just come in, get your product, pay for it, and leave. There's a much greater exchange and a greater degree of transparency. So what's, what I really enjoy about that is that it allows people not only to see and understand and develop relationships with the people who are making their food, but the people that are growing their food, and they also get to participate in so much more um, of just how food goes from seed to plate. And um, it's more than just about eating. It's, it's about building community too and educating people. They don't just come in and buy a healthy product. They're understanding why it's healthy. And in the context of that community, they get to have a shared experience of how their body is responding to that food. And my body always feels really nurtured after eating one of her meals. That's Wonderful. Sweet. Thank you very much. And we get to explore things that we wouldn't pick up yeah. for ourselves. So you, you want it to be at least room temperature. Okay. But it goes really well with a thick slab of butter <laughs> and some sauerkraut. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Portlanders understand CSA programs. They understand farmers markets. They understand local food and they pride themselves on it. This is the first time I've lived in a town where it hasn't been, oh, do you shop at the farmer's market as much as it's, what farmer's market do you shop at? CSKs are new. It's a really new concept. People don't understand them. And so I decided to go with the CSA model. It was easy for people to understand a membership. Tressa, what are we eating this week? <laughs> That's the lamb bone broth. Lamb bone broth. This is the goat stew. Uh, Caribbean black beans, lacto-fermented beets. Okay. It'll be fun. Awesome. Thank you. They get a share of what comes in that week, and it was a way of getting them out of their heads in terms of the preparation and just into the experience of eating better. Especially setting, you know, explaining that these are food concentrates that we're offering. It's an easy way for someone to eat healthy with the least amount of commitment. We avoid cooking three days a week. Most of the way that we market the memberships are that you get a. a steady supply of prepared foods that then you can add $10 worth of fresh ingredients to and eat off for an entire week. And you know that there is a solid amount of concentrated nutrition in each one of the preparations and you can stretch it to whatever degree you want to make it last or transform itself. They all need one more level of preparation before they're totally done. And that might just be heating them up. But again, people, it's choose your own adventure food in a lot of ways. Uh, Tressa and I are excited that you're joining us for the first table talk and we're hoping this is a series that we can do seasonally 
to usher in the season for everybody with food and conversation about the season and how you can use foods to um, nourish your body through the season. Portland is also very, very social in its food culture. The dinner sold out every week. So in the beginning of the business, while I was trying to develop a, a public education about what these foods were and why they were important, once you give people an experience of eating this way, they're hooked. And that's where I figured if I had enough ways for people to engage it, I didn't care how they came as long as they came to the kitchen. Um, so that we were really leaning on the dinners heavily in the beginning. We, we work so much with getting di different speakers in, but they're always so uniquely different. And what's always fun about the dinners with Andrea is that they're always so intensely nutritional, which is really fun for me because if you guys are kind of food geeks like I am a food geek, you really want that meat, you know, of the why we're eating what and how. and. So, uh, so these are always really fun classes. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about the menu tonight. So what you're about to enjoy is a nettle soup. It has some fiddleheads in it. The crumb fresh is um, cultured dairy from Norris Creamery. So it's pasteurized at a very, very low temperature. Um, and then the next course, we're going to have the spring chinook, which I'm sure you guys have seen all the fishermen out on the river in their boats. It's that time, which is so exciting. So we got a few spring chinooks, and um, we're doing that steamed on papillot with uh, some herbs and some black trumpet mushrooms. And then we'll serve that with just some roasted spring vegetables, which actually go really well with the cream fresh too. <laughs> and then um, we've got a, a spring kraut that I did that has nettles and chamomile and some really pretty things in it, um, radishes. That's what we'll have for dinner tonight. And the other thing I want to tell you about the kitchen um, is, well, it's a couple things. One, for those of you that might not be aware, we do these dinners every Friday, which is really fun. And, um, and then classes on Monday nights. The other thing, for those of you that aren't super familiar with what we do, are the memberships. But um, I'm so glad you're here, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about the food specifically later, but otherwise I'll hand you over to Andrea yeah. and enjoy the soup. So my name's Andrea Nakayama. Men, some of you know me. And I'm a nutritionist. And this time we decided that we'd join forces to create a menu, a supper, and a whole experience with conversation that would truly usher you all into the season. The influx of leafy greens will replenish the body of any nutrient deficiencies that are, came from the lack of fresh fruits and vegetables over the winter. So keep doing that month of committing to every single meal is a very replenishing activity. And of particular interest are the wild weeds, which we'll talk more about later. Again, dandelion, chickweed, which is really fun to find right now, miner's lettuce, and nettles, like in your soup. And these are all local and easy to find right now. So these are vada foods. These green foods are vada, and that means they're wind-like. So that's another dosha. The three doshas are kapha, pitta, and vada. And I always like to think of the qualities of the food I eat. Food has character. And when you eat it, you ingest and digest it. And when I think about it like this, I want to embody the essence of a weed. I want to be adaptable and to withstand all conditions. Weeds are pretty incredible. And a young weed, a spring weed, or a bud has other particular energies. It's potent. It's fertile with possibility. It's bursting with momentum. It's active yet contained. And it's the first on the scene. It's a true leader. So if that's all a bit too woo-woo to think about the energetics of the food, think about the benefits of sidestepping agribusiness. They do not need to be cultivated, and therefore they save energy and the Earth's resources. And if you know your weeds, it can mean a free dinner. <laughs> well, that's always the goal, isn't it? To defeat the big agri-monster. Isn't that what we call it? The industrial food agri-monster. Um, and I do think the answer is more small food businesses like this, creating and educating people just to participate and how they're already participating in a food system. Um, you know, empowering them to just have an opinion about it, to feel successful when they make choices like buying one of my memberships. And that that small piece is doing something wonderful for a much bigger complex that it's hard to even begin to think of how to attack. And that's why I say, as I grow, I don't want to become a corporation. I don't want to become a giant business that satisfies the needs of people all over. I think the answer is more small, diverse food systems that are able to really 
customize the experience to that community, and that's going to change from community to community to community. Um, so I do think that more solution-oriented food suggestions, we'll call them, uh, is, is really the answer. It's moving in a direction where food has a face again. Thanks, Tressa, for not only getting us out of our kitchen, but into yours, filling our bodies, our minds, and our hearts. So glad to hear you say that. Thank you for coming. It was a pleasure. I'm Holly Fee, bringing you the tools to be sustainable today.